Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here this evening uh, and for, for turning out or tuning in, I should say. Um, so uh, I hope there'll be uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. But I mean, of course, if you have questions as we go along, then please do um, do interrupt if that's uh, if that's possible so that I can kind of clarify things as we as we go. Um, Great, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about how we make weather forecasts and the role that, that physics plays here. So firstly, I actually wanted to bounce this question straight back to you. So how do you think we make a, a weather forecast here in the UK? And I'm going to give you four options and then I'm going to ask you to vote on them. So I'll just go through the options first. If I can do that. Oh, so... Firstly, statistics. We know how the weather has behaved in the past and we can use this information in an intelligent way to predict the future. So that's your first option. Your second option is simulators. We build a computer simulator of the atmosphere and see what it says is going to happen uh, for the weather over the coming days to weeks. C, we see what's coming. So here in the UK, weather tends to move in uh, from the west. So we see storms developing over the Atlantic, we can see them coming our way, so it's very easy to then forecast for the coming week. Or finally, do we just guess? So um, I think there should be a poll up. Uh, so please uh, cast your votes and uh, we can see see what people think. So you can see the votes coming in. So we can wait a few more seconds for anyone who wants to vote to vote. Okay, so shall we shall we leave it there then? Excellent. Okay, so the uh, the favorite answer here is simulators. Uh, with see what's coming and statistics coming close second. And we had a couple of votes for simply guess. So um, can we get rid of the poll now? We can get rid of it. There. Great, yeah. So, uh, and the correct answer is simulators. We do build a computer simulator of the atmosphere uh, and see what it says will happen. So well done for getting the answer uh, correct. Um, a surprising uh, number of people have absolutely no idea how we make uh, a weather forecast, even though it's something they probably access, uh, at, you know, probably once a day um, to, to see, what's, see what's happening. Um, but before uh, I move on and talk about how we build these computer simulators, I actually wanted to talk about the other two uh, reasonable options that I put on here. So see what's coming and statistics. So firstly, see what's coming. This is actually a really good um, uh, tip uh, if you want to make a very short range forecast. Um, so if you, if you are interested in you know, cycling home from the lab, you know it's a bit rainy out and you, you just want to know when there's a half hour window when it's going to be dry, then what you can do is go onto the, the Met Office's rain radar and see when there's a gap in the clouds coming. So seeing what's coming is an, is an extremely good way of making a very accurate short range forecast, but it's not gonna tell you anything useful uh, for, for much beyond that. Um, but the first one, statistics, um, is something that uh, is actually uh, was very widely used out until about the 1960s or 70s. So I'll say a few more words about that uh, before we move on. So the idea with this statistical approach um, is that we can just create a very large uh, library uh, of past weather. Um, so what we can do is, to, is, is create a kind of make a synoptic map of what the weather looks like uh, today, for example. Uh, and then we look back through our library, through our database. Uh, and what we're looking for uh, is maps which look similar or a bit similar to what the weather looks like today. So maybe we'd think there were some similarities from this date in 2018. As you know, there's a similar kind of low pressure system uh, here to the, to the Southwest. Um, okay, maybe if we book, look back a bit further, we can find something else that's got some similarities. We continue looking further and further back in time uh, until we find a map, which is a really a pretty good match uh, for what the weather looks like today. Uh, and then simply we, we select that occasion then and we see what happened 
uh, to the weather after that date. So we see what happened to the weather the week following the, you know, January 1986. And we can then issue that as our forecast uh, for the weather for the coming week. Uh, and this was very widely used up until about the, the 60s. Uh, it's a method called analog forecasting. Uh, but the problem is, is it, it really doesn't work very well at all. Uh, and the reason for this, and the reason for this is chaos or the butterfly effect. Uh, and so the butterfly effect is a, a phrase that I expect many of you will have heard of. Uh, so the idea is, uh, is, is quite simple. It's the, the, the idea is that, you know, small, um, small changes can have a large impact. So the flap of a, a, of a butterfly's wings in one part of the world can set off uh, a tornado on the other side of the world, is how it was phrased. Um, and this, uh, this phrase is really permeated into popular culture. Um, so, I mean, so for example, I found this, this picture of some kind of wall art, and it says, be the change you want to see in the world, the butterfly effect. And this idea that you can make small changes in your life, you know, you do a good deed to somebody and then this will kind of cascade, uh, have a ripple effect in some way and, uh, and, and um, uh, have much wider impacts than the kind of scale of your initial, your initial um, action. Um, I found this, this movie called The Butterfly Effect. I don't know if anyone's seen it. I'm afraid I haven't. Um, but uh, in, in it, um, Ashton uh, Kutcher is apparently a time traveler. He can go back in time and make changes in his past life, which he's trying to, to do to improve his present life, but all has unintended consequences. Again, this idea that making a very small change in the past can have a really big change in the, in the, in the future. A better movie, I'd say, would be Jurassic Park. This is uh, the only uh, film I know of uh, which has got a, a chaos theorist as one of the main characters. That's this, this guy here. Here he is explaining chaos theory to one of the other characters. Um, again, it's this idea that um, very tiny, um, tiny changes here, the kind of a tiny mutation in the DNA of one of the dinosaurs can have huge unintended uh, consequences. Uh, and finally, it's, it's worth saying that, you know, this kind of general idea isn't very new. So here's a, a, a kind of traditional proverb or a poem, for want of a nail. So for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. So again, how something very... Uh, small and inconsequential can have these very large um, uh, end, uh, end effects. But mathematically, what is chaos? So this really is a kind of a glorified um, advert for the uh, short option S32, which, uh, which I uh, co-lecture which is unfortunately not running this year because it runs every other year, but it will be next year. So if um, so, so remember it when you're choosing your short options. Um, but a mathematical definition of chaos would be the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, uh, so Ed Lorentz was the, 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 uh, the scientist, the mathematician that discovered chaos, and he was really a meteorologist and he puts it best. He says chaos is when the present determines the future. So we're stressing here that there's no, no probabilities involved. This is, not, uh, this is not quantum mechanics. This is, a, this is a deterministic system. The present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. So very small changes in the present can uh, kind of amplify uh, in such a way that we, we're not able to determine what the future is. Uh, and despite its, uh, its pervasiveness in popular culture, chaos is really not at all a generic property of systems. Um, so to demonstrate this, I'm just going to show you an extremely simple problem from mechanics, a non-chaotic system. So what we have here is, uh, is a cannon uh, firing a cannonball we determine or we set two things, the initial speed of the cannonball and the initial angle of the cannon. And what we would like to predict then is how far the, ca the cannonball travels. And this is a simple problem to solve. We can write down the solution here. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, 
when we come to perform this experiment, we're going to take, make some measurement of the angle of the cannon. We're going to make some measurement of the speed of the cannonball U. And the thing is, is that even if we can't determine what those two numbers are precisely, we're going to have a pretty good estimate of what the final distance is D that this cannonball travels. And you can imagine kind of expanding this out as a Taylor expansion and it's, you know, a very tiny error in A is going to lead to a very tiny difference in D. Uh, so this is a non-chaotic system. Um, but now let's consider a chaotic system, um, perhaps the most famous chaotic system. This is the, the what's called the Lorentz 63 system, which was um, put forward by um, uh, Ed Lorentz in, in uh, his, his paper in which he really introduced uh, chaos. Um, it's, um, it's a system described by this a very uh, kind of simple set of three equations. So we've got three different variables, x, y, and z. Um, you can see that these equations are nonlinear. So we have these cross terms in X and Z and X and Y. And this is actually important. We, we require a nonlinearity in order to have a chaotic system. Um, and what I'm showing here is, is called the butterfly attractor. Uh, so and the attractor is really just showing you the kind of space that a system likes to live in. So really what this is, is a very long uh, trajectory or a very, a very long solution of this set of equations. And so you can see that it has this very intriguing structure, the solution, but it does have a degree of kind of re regularity to it. All right, so I'm now going to show you um, a, a, a movie, a simulation of these equations, which has been pr produced by Josh Dorrington. So he's a, he's a PhD student in our group. So um, hopefully you can now see uh, my other screen with the movie. Is that, is that right? Yep. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click somewhere on this attractor and you'll see a red dot appear, which is then the, the kind of the solution to the equations where, I, where I've started it from. And this will then evolve forward in time. So let's give it a go. Here we go. So you can see now how this solution uh, to these Lorentz 63 equations evolves in time. But what you can now see is actually that it wasn't a single point which I set going. It was actually uh, 100 points. Uh, and after only a very short length of time, the solutions start to diverge from each other. So even though these, the kind of error or the difference in the starting conditions was, was not at all visible in the beginning, after a very short time, we've got to this situation where we have like no predictability at all. We have no idea at all um, what the, the solution of the, uh, the system would be. Okay, so we should now be back on the presentation. Um, okay. So this is, uh, this is really the characteristic or the, the, the defining property of chaotic systems is that if you, if you average over many experiments, you expect to see an exponential uh, growth of errors. Uh, and so in, a, in a, a lot of this talk, I talk about this kind of error growth. And the idea here is that we have some a kind of true initial state of the system, maybe this dash line here, and that would be like the, tr the, the real angle of our, our canon. And we have some measurement of the system, some estimate of the angle, some estimate of the starting conditions of the Lorentz system. Uh, and there's some error between these. And over time, these two solutions, the true, the true solution, sorry, down here in the forecast, uh, diverge from each other. Uh, and the key, uh, the, the key kind of uh, parameter here that we, we talk about is, the, is called the Lyapunov exponent, lambda. Uh, which, which appears here in the exponential growth. <clears throat> and this characterizes this average rate of error growth. Uh, and we know that the atmosphere is chaotic because we can calculate its Lyapunov exponents and we find that it has a number of positive exponents. So, so we know that it's a, a chaotic system and a really a very chaotic system. Okay, so right, what have we learned so far? Um, so using past weather as a basis for future weather doesn't work. And this is because the atmosphere is chaotic. So when we went through and looked through our, our kind of database of, uh, of, of states of the, of the weather, and we tried to find one in the past that looks similar today to today, I mean, the problem is that we're never ever going to be able to find one that is close enough to today to be able to make a good forecast. 
because even tiny differences grow exponentially quickly. And so, and really the, the kind of differences between these two maps, um, are, 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 you know, are, are fairly sizable. And so actually over a very short length of time, the two forecast, the forecast and the real, the real weather will diverge from each other. Okay, so how do we make a weather forecast then? Well, the answer uh, is that we turn to the equations of physics which describe the atmosphere. Yeah, this is way over my head already. Oh. I'm oh, sorry, hang on. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions as we go along, if somebody would like to ask one. Or if not, we can take them at the end. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, so here I'm showing the equations which describe the atmosphere. And these are equations which are introduced throughout uh, your, your, your physics degree. And so um, I don't expect you to have come across uh, necessarily any of them at this point, depending on what year you're in. Uh, and they're only all brought together and used to describe the atmosphere if you take the fourth year major option in, in atmospheric and oceanic physics. But so what I'm going to do uh, is talk through each of these equations uh, in a very uh, kind of qualitative way to help you get an understanding of what, of what each one is uh, before we move on. So firstly, we have got a set of equations called the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, so these are the equations of fluid dynamics, uh, which you would find out about in your third year. Um, and so uh, these equations, this, there's three equations here really, because this is a vector U term. So we've got the uh, wind speed uh, in each of our three um, uh, Cartesian directions. Um, and these uh, equations are actually just saying a conservation of momentum uh, for, for, for a parcel of fluid. So, uh, or really it's a kind of forces mass times acceleration equation. So, so here we've got the acceleration of the fluid. Um, here we've got um, a gradient in pressure is providing a force on the fluid. Uh, the fluid in this case is, is, is the air, of course. Um, these next two terms are called the Coriolis force and the centrifugal force. Now these two terms come about because actually we've transformed from a regular a Cartesian coordinate, oh sorry, well we have also done that. So, so here we've moved around, we've moved from a, a, a fixed uh, frame of reference to a rotating frame of reference. So you get these two forces appearing because we're now in a rotating frame of reference. And finally we've got gravity. Uh, and you might be wondering what this capital D uh, uh, nonsense is going over here on the left. Well, so that's because if we're thinking about conservation of momentum, what we're thinking about it is for you know for a little a little parcel or a little a little you could think of a little balloon full of fluid, um, momentum should be conserved. So um, you know so if you had this little parcel of fluid, if you applied a pressure force, you could calculate the acceleration. But the problem is, is that actually when we're thinking about fluids, it's much more convenient to think about how the fluid is moving over a fixed point in space. So for example, what is the, the wind speed going to, how's the wind speed over Oxford going to change tomorrow? So this capital D is reminding us that this particular equation is for, uh, is only valid for if we're moving with, uh, you're kind of moving with a parcel with the fluid. And so we have to do an additional, a, a kind of conversion to move uh, to a, a, a static frame where we're, we're just uh, looking at a particular point. Okay, so our second equation is called the continuity equation. So again, we're thinking in this parcel of air framework. Um, and what we're doing here is we're showing how the density of air in that parcel is going to change. Uh, and so you'll see here, we've got the divergence of the wind. And if you remember your, um, like your kind of divergence theorem, you'd know that you can relate that to a flux through a surface. And so what we're essentially saying here is that if you have a flow of fluid into your parcel, the density is going to go up. So that's very intuitive. Uh, and then finally, we have these two equations, which are the thermodynamic equations. So we've got um, two equations which tell us how temperature and pressure and density of the air are going to change as we heat it. Uh, and so this Q here is our, our heating rate. And um, I mean, the most important heating rate for, for the atmosphere is coming from condensation of water in clouds. And this is providing a huge heat source uh, to our air. 
Great, okay, so we've got our equations. So what we're going to do then is code these up into a computer simulator. Um, I'm sure this is a, a process that you have gone or will go through uh, with various equations in your computer labs. Uh, so here I'm just showing a very simple uh, schematic, but you can do something a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, having produced our simulator, we can then make our forecast. So firstly, what we're going to do is use a range of measurements to try and work out what the state uh, of the atmosphere is today. We're going to ingest these into uh, our simulator and use these to make the forecast. Um, yeah, I, I, I just say a couple more words about these measurements. Um, I mean, so, so firstly, I don't, you might not realize, but we still do rely quite heavily on weather balloons. This might seem a little bit um, old fashioned, but there's no other way to really get um, a, a good profile of um, temperature, um, humidity, um, et cetera, as a function of height from direct measurements. Um, the other thing that we rely heavily on is satellites, but satellites are actually giving us an indirect measurement of the state of the, of the atmosphere. And that's because what the satellite is measuring is radiation, is, is the radiance um, uh, kind of um, hitting the satellite sensor. And so that's not telling us directly what the temperature, um, what the wind speed, um, what the humidity uh, is like as a function of height. So those are things you have to infer from the data you collect. Uh, and then finally, we make it make a lot of use of ground based measurements. Uh, but even with all these measurements, um, we're somewhat patchy in our coverage. So we, we can't really compute or we can't estimate the uh, temperature, wind speed, humidity at every single point over the Earth and at every point going up into the atmosphere. So what we do is we go through this process of blending these observations with our our knowledge of the physics of the atmosphere, which comes from to get a more kind of complete uh, picture of the starting conditions. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, uh, what our model produces is again, an estimate of the, the, future, um, the future weather. But this is actually interpreted by a meteorologist who then presents it uh, to the public on the television. So, so the person that is presenting the forecast here has, has really produced the forecast from the raw uh, information they get out of the model. So it's something, something to bear in mind is that they actually are a, a kind of a meteorologist by training the person giving the forecast on the television. Okay, so how good are we at predicting UK weather tomorrow? Well, actually, we're, we're reasonably good, um, what, whatever you, you, your kind of prior uh, idea was. Um, so here, um, I'm showing this, um, this kind of accuracy statistic from the UK Met Office. Uh, and the green line is the percentage of days uh, where the forecast for the maximum temperature the following day was within two degrees of what, uh, what actually happened. And you can see that they're pretty routinely hitting a kind of 95% accuracy accuracy for weather uh, for, for weather one day ahead. So that's great, excellent. Okay, so how about uh, the next week? Ah, so, so this is where it gets a bit more tricky. So here, what I'm showing is um, a forecast in blue for the two meter temperature um, uh, over London uh, out to what are we going out to nine days, and in black we have what actually happened. So you can see that for the first three days, we have a remarkably accurate forecast. This is fantastic. This is much better than even that plus or minus um, two degree level of accuracy that the Met Office was uh, after. But then after, well, after five days, the two forecasts, the forecast and the observations massively diverge from each other. So the forecast is saying that this, whoops, this, sorry, un this kind of unconventional uh, heat wave is in October is going to continue. Whereas what actually happened is that uh, the temperatures dropped down by, by 10 degrees over the course of a day. Uh, and this shouldn't surprise us because we've already heard that the atmosphere is chaotic. And so, you know, tiny, tiny errors in the starting conditions. So tiny errors in our estimate of what the weather looks like on the first day, are going to exponentially grow in time on average. Um, and moreover, we've 
we're producing this forecast using a simulator of the atmosphere. So we've um, approximated our physics equations. And in some cases, we've had to make quite, um, uh, you know, uh, quite kind of crude approximations in order to, to, for the equations to, to run in a timely manner. Uh, and this essentially is also in introducing a tiny error into our forecast at every single time step in the model. And all of these errors also exponentially grow in time. So, so it's all lost then when we're thinking about our forecast or his butterfly. Well, the solution is that instead of making a single forecast for the weather for the coming week, uh, we can make a set or an ensemble of forecasts. So here I'm showing now 50 forecasts for the weather for the coming week. Uh, and the idea is that when we make these forecasts, we have to represent all the sources of uncertainty in the forecast that we can think about. So we make tiny perturbations to the starting conditions that are consistent with our knowledge of the current state of the atmosphere. Uh, and we also make perturbations to the equations as we produce the forecast which are really um, representing uncertainty in, you know, in the formulation of the model itself. Uh, and when we do this, we end up with a probabilistic forecast. Uh, and you can see actually that for this particular uh, date back in 2018, the weather was actually really quite unpredictable. We seem to have this bimodal distribution coming out with you know, quite a lot of the ensemble members are darting down following what really happened, showing this, um, this get this sudden uh, Kind of drop in temperature. But we have this other little cluster of, of forecasts which are staying up here near, um, near this kind of un unseasonably kind of warm heat wave that we're getting. But the thing is, is that, I mean, actually, even though we can't um, give a, an exact forecast out for, for 10 days as to the coming weather, what we're doing here is, is is, pr is providing a lot of information about how predictable the atmosphere is. And this is information then that is useful uh, for people who rely on, uh, on weather forecasts to make decisions. So by being um, honest uh, in, in what we are able to say about the future, we're actually able to add a lot of value to the, to the forecast. Okay, so the next question I wanted to ask is, well, how far ahead can we theoretically predict? And, um, and the thing is, is that, you know, in this chaotic, um, in this framework for, for kind of chaotic systems that I set up, we can always increase how far in the future we predict by just simply keeping on reducing the, the uncertainties in our initial conditions. So, you know, we could think we, we want to be able to make a, a three week forecast for the weather over Oxford. So all we need to do is to, to be sending up more weather balloons over you know, particular locations over the North Atlantic. We need to be taking more ground-based measurements. And by doing so, we reduce our initial uncertainties. Uh, and we can eventually always find this. So here's our initial error. We can always set this to small enough so that our kind of error at some particular date in the future is within our kind of tolerance level. So does this mean that we, if we can effectively, um, we could effectively predict out to an infinite time horizon if we were able to reduce our errors enough? And to really understand the question for the atmosphere, we really need to understand turbulence. So what is turbulence? Well, I mean, it's fair to say that there's no uh, agreed definition of turbulence. Um, but most people would agree that uh, to some of these, or maybe all of these definitions, it's, it's definitely a very complex flow. It's intermittent, uh, it's multi-scale, disordered, and chaotic. Uh, and you can see some of these um, kind of properties here in this, um, this very turbulent flow. This is actually in the, in the, in the, the ocean as opposed to the atmosphere. In particular, we can see this multi-scale nature. We see these, these swirls, which we usually call eddies, which occur on really a vast range of different scales. We have very large ones, and we have very small ones, and they're all interacting with each other in a very unpredictable way. Oops. Okay, so let's go through a thought experiment uh, to think about the predictability of such a flow. 
So we're going to imagine that our turbulent flow has got these eddies on a range of different scales. So um, we're now moving back to the atmosphere. So we, we imagine that we have subcloud eddies, like little swirls of wind which, which pick up leaves in your, in your front garden. Um, and these little swirls, these little swirls are kind of maybe on a scale of one meter. We can imagine that clouds are really uh, indicating much larger scale eddies, 10 kilometers all the way up to a weather system, you know, a kind of a low or high pressure system, which is on a scale of a thousand of kilometers. And so the question is, if we have an, an error in our starting conditions on a particular scale, how long is it before it infects the largest of scale? So let's imagine that we had some, some error in our measurements of these tiny, tiny uh, eddies on the one meter scale. And how on earth could we go about measuring uh, every little flurry of wind? How long is it before that infects our prediction of how, um, how uh, low and high pressure systems are going to move over the UK? So we can start trying to get a handle on some numbers here. So what we're going to do is, 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 is define each eddy to, eddy to have a wave number k. And each of these eddies has a characteristic velocity. And so uh, the, the characteristic velocity is given by this expression here. So k, again, our wave number, times the energy spectral density all to the power of a half. Now this, um, this I've come up with just by um, a dimensional analysis. So energy spectral density per unit mass, we imagine we times that again um, by the wave number, we're now up into an energy per unit mass to the square root is then going to give us a velocity scale. Having de determined a velocity scale, we can, we can kind of ca characterize a turnover time for an eddy. So how long does it take for the eddy to, 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 to turn over? And so in other words, we're thinking of the kind of time scale for some parcel of air that has the velocity given by this characteristic velocity to move a scale characteristic of our, our wave number. So a one over K to get into a length scale. Um, and so then simply by combining the, the velocity and the, the scale, we can come up then with a turnover time, which is then uh, going like um, essentially so uh, distance, so one over K divided by the speed. So then we get our uh, K cubed times the energy spectral density now to the minus a half. Okay, uh, and the reason I'm doing it in terms of this energy spectral density is because this is something that we actually have a prediction for from turbulence theory uh, in terms of how it scales with wave number. So this then allows us to, to come up with a kind of characteristic turnover time as a function of wave number. And then the final part of our thought experiment then is okay. Um, let's imagine that our initial error is confined to one of these very tiny eddies. So, so we've got our, our uh, you know, we keep, if we go back to the previous slide here, imagine that we keep kind of halving the scale of the eddies. So we start off with the, the largest eddy is the weather system that we're ultimately interested in. Let's, let's keep halving the scale of the eddies down to the scale at which we're gonna have our initial error. So then that gives us uh, our initial error on this uh, scale of, of two n times the, the, the kind of end eddy. And the question is how long before it infects that large scale? And so what we're going to do is just sum up all of these turnover times. We have this kind of conceptual idea that we start off with the, the error on this tiny, this tiny subcloud flurry of wind, that then this error grows. And once it's grown large enough, it starts infecting the next scale up. The next scale up then, um, the, the error grows and grows before it again infects the next scale. And this kind of cascades upscale, ultimately affecting how our weather system behaves. And so what we can do is we can sum all of these time scales uh, and see what happens as, as, we, as n goes to infinity. So essentially, if we, if we squash our er initial error down into an infinitesimally small scale, what happens? Can we, in, can we extend our predictability horizon out to infinity? And the answer is no, because this series converges. It's a geometric uh, series here. And actually, much to our horror, we find that the, the time scale 
it predicts is, is actually around seven days if we plug in values for a kind of large scale weather system. So this is essentially saying that three dimensional turbulence theory is predicting something vastly more severe than chaos in terms of how predictable the atmosphere is. I mean, with chaos, the prediction is that, I mean, we have exponential error growth, but if we want to extend our forecast, we just push the error back to a smaller and smaller scale. But if we take turbulence into account, it's actually predicting a finite predictability horizon that we would never, it's impossible to predict the atmosphere beyond seven days. And so the question is then, what well, is this, I mean, is this actually the case? Um, so that there are two caveats to this discussion. Um, so the first uh, is um, here on the left, I'm showing the actual uh, spectral density for the atmosphere as a function of wavelength. Uh, and you can see that it follows, um, if we go back to the previous slide, we were using this prediction from turbulence of um, a minus five thirds spectrum. And you can see that we do have this spectrum for a very large portion of the atmosphere, but at the largest length scales, um, we actually have a, a steeper spectrum. And that's because the atmosphere behaves in a kind of quasi two dimensional way on the largest scales, just because of the Earth's rotation. And so that actually affects um, this prediction. Um, this kind of flow doesn't have this property um, that, uh, that you have a finite predictability horizon. Um, and the second thing to bear in mind is that actually for these kind of chaotic systems, how predictable they are is actually a function of where you start in the system. So when I showed you the simulation earlier from the Lorentz system, we started from somewhere up, up on one of the lobes. Uh, and we were actually able to predict it for a while before the, the, the different points scattered out. But if I started from somewhere else, we would have seen a different picture. And if we take these two things into account, I mean, what it ends up being is that we believe there is a finite predictability horizon for the atmosphere, but it is a bit longer than this rather pessimistic seven days. In the extra tropics, it looks likely to be more like 15 or 16 days. And in the tropics, it could be longer than three weeks. Um, but it does seem that there is a limit uh, to how far we can predict into the future. Um, so I'll just now say a few words um, before wrapping up. I mean, what does this mean? Does this mean that we actually can only um, hope to predict, um, you know, what the weather is going to be like in Oxford or in the UK for two to three weeks? Can we say anything at all about next month or next year? Um, and the answer is, well, yes, we can. And the reason is because, you know, while the atmosphere only has this, um, the, these quite short predictability horizons, other components of the Earth system uh, operate on much longer time scales, and they can give predictability to the atmosphere. So this is things like the oceans, the ocean moves much more slowly than the atmosphere, um, but can uh, affect how how the atmosphere above it evolves. And the cryosphere moves on an even longer time scale, and um, how the ice, um, how ice sheets um, evolve. And again, they give predictability to the atmosphere. And the biosphere also affects the atmosphere. And so then it becomes a case of detecting what the predictable signal is from among the unpredictable noise. So we're not going to be able to predict precisely whether it's going to rain or not on a given day, but we would be able to say something about the likelihood of you know, a wet season or a dry season. Um, so when it comes to the UK um, on a seasonal time scale, the most important phenomenon to us is a, is a phenomenon called the North Atlantic Oscillation. And this is actually um, a pair, uh, this is the kind of difference in pressure uh, between uh, Greenland and, and the Azores. And, and all this does is it steers the jet stream. So um, in uh, one phase of the, the, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the jet stream is more likely to pass over the UK, bringing stormy weather and, and lots of rain. Uh, and in the other phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, the jet stream is steered to the south of us and we have much calmer conditions. But this uh, North Atlantic Oscillation or NAO is something that we actually are able to predict reasonably well on a seasonal time scale. So the Met Office actually reckon they can predict it on a 13 month time scale. So saying something about not just this coming winter, but the winter after that. 
And the reason is, is that we get predictability coming to it from various things, including um, the kind of polar ice caps, um, kind of big tropical weather systems and um, things like this. And this is really an active area of research is understanding what gives us predictability in the North Atlantic. If we want to look out for longer, then what we can do is turn our attention to uh, the ocean. And so there's another phenomenon that's going on in the Atlantic, which is called uh, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. And this is a very long, um, a long uh, time scale change in the average ocean temperature in the North Atlantic. Uh, and so you can see uh, this is showing the, the kind of changes that we get in ocean temperature really over the last hundred years. And you can see we have this this very low frequency variability, but it um, but it has quite a substantial impact on the kind of seasonal average temperatures that we get over the UK in the summer. Um, so when we're in a positive phase of this, uh, this, this oscillation, then essentially the UK is being bathed in these warmer than average waters. And so we see that in the, in the temperature over the UK. Uh, but the interesting thing actually then is that this is something that we can generally predict on a time scale of kind of five to 10 years. Uh, so actually there is some uh, chance of making really quite long time scale forecasts if what you're interested in is these, these um, quite average uh, statistics. Um, and then my final slide, um, I put this in because I think that as physicists, we can sometimes get a little conceited uh, that, uh, that our science can solve everything. Uh, and while weather forecasting certainly is a problem in physics, I wanted to emphasize that climate prediction is actually a, a problem that unifies the sciences. Uh, and that we really do rely on a very big uh, interdisciplinary collaborations in order to make a headway with climate prediction, not least uh, trying to understand how, how people and society interact with, um, kind of respond to and, and then uh, affect climate change. But I mean, also, um, so just to highlight, so earth sciences is really vital for understanding paleo climate changes. So to really place the current anthropogenic climate change in context. Uh, we need um, biologists working in climate models so that we can capture how ecosystems change and feed back onto the climate. Uh, and and uh, we also um, rely on a kind of chemists, atmospheric chemists who, um, who uh, can explain and model how uh, clouds and pollution interact with each other. And there's some interesting positive feedbacks that can happen uh, there. So that then brings me to uh, the end of my talk. Um, so I can now take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Um, just before, like, we try and do applause on Zoom, but it doesn't really work because we're muted, but the applause is there uh, in thought. So uh, in the chat, we have one question um, saying, is the Lyapunov exponent of the atmosphere corresponding to the seven days predictability time scale? i.e. like is t inversely proportional to lambda ah uh, yeah so this this um this seven so the seven day predictability horizon i think doesn't really pan out in the atmosphere so that's kind of what we uh, we would come up with from a, a prediction based on three-dimensional turbulence theory uh, and our best estimates of the kind of predictability horizon in the atmosphere are uh, longer than that, so more like 15 days in the extra tropics. Um, so then as to how that relates to the Lyapunov exponent, um, there should, yeah, so there should be a direct relationship between the two. Um, what we actually often talk about for Lyapunov exponents is instead of this kind of one average number characterizing the system, and um, we often think of a more uh, kind of instantaneous or state dependent Lyapunov exponent. Um, so that's one which really characterizes like the instantaneous predictability of the system. Um, so I suppose if you if you think back to that kind of two week forecast I was showing, um, it showed that, you know, after just a, a few days, all of the different uh, individual forecasts diverged a lot from each other. And so that's indicating that the atmosphere is in a very unpredictable state. So there you'd have a very highly up and off exponent. But there are other days or, um, when the atmosphere is actually very predictable. So, um, so sometimes in the summer, for example, we get a, or in the winter, we get a block setting in over the UK, which is like a high pressure system. And these systems just kind of sit 
over the UK for sometimes maybe three weeks at a time. So if you ever kind of think back to a summer when it was beautiful blue skies and kind of a heat wave for three weeks, that is a block sitting and they're very predictable and very long lasting. And then you have this much more extended predictability. So quite a lot of these things are yet kind of averaged properties of the atmosphere, but it actually varies quite a lot from day to day. Cool. So we have two more questions in the chat. Also, um, it's cool. It's awesome to put questions in the chat, but if you want, you can also unmute yourself. Um, that's not a problem either. Uh, so one of the questions is, does global warming affect weather prediction in any way? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I think it's something we don't really know the answer to. Um, and that's, um, I mean, it's because while our, our kind of our, our climate models agree a lot as to the fact that there is this kind of globally averaged warming. The things which which is more uncertain is how how the kind of variability will change into the future. Um, and so here we have quite a lot of disagreement between climate models. Um, so um, so if you want to ask questions like, you know, is it going to be you know more or less stormy over the UK? Are we going to have more or fewer of these very predictable blocks? I mean, we actually don't, we really don't know what the answer is um, to, to those questions. So yeah, good question though. Um, and then the other question on the chat was, what sorts of things cause the two Atlantic oscillations that you were talking about? Ah, yeah, okay, let's, let me see. Right, so the North Atlantic oscillation um, is generally believed to be a kind of emergent property of, the kind of atmospheric fluid dynamics. So, so uh, if you take the, the kind of fourth year um, uh, atmospheres and ocean option, you'll learn about this, uh, this, this kind of wave called a, a Rossby wave. And essentially this is a, a kind of pattern of low and high pressure systems that moves around, uh, around the earth. Um, so you can kind of think of it like a breaking wave in terms of a kind of uh, outline of pressure that kind of propagates around. Um, and this is something that really is emerging from the uh, from the kind of fluid dynamics equations and is then kind of intimately related to this, this, this kind of these low pressure systems. Um, when it comes to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, so here I'm a little more hazy not being an oceanographer. Um, so it's my understanding that it's linked to the overturning circulation in the Atlantic. Um, so, so what that is, is that um, is the Atlantic basin is very unusual um, in, the, in, the, in the ocean in that, you, in that it, ex, it kind of extends from the, the South Pole all the way to the North Pole. You don't have land uh, covering around at the, at the top. Um, and so what, what, what you get is you get this, um, you get this kind of overturning where you have warm water uh, that is, let me think, is moving from the south up to the north and then it sinks and it moves along the base of the ocean at depth. Um, and I think this is somehow related, fluctuations in this are related to the AMO, but I'm afraid that I can't really give a very good, a very good answer there. Um, I think it's also related to, um, yeah, so the amount of sinking water off the coast of Greenland kind of spins up a positive or a negative phase. It's a bit wavy, hand wavy. Awesome. Sorry. No. Okay. Um, is one of those reasons also associated with the El Nino Southern Oscillation? Ah, so the, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation is in the Pacific Ocean. So that's um, that's a, a very interesting phenomena, which is um, really a, a kind of coupled ocean atmosphere phenomena. And so I think it's I think the AMO is is completely distinct from the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, but there are some kind of some studies which maybe suggest that the El Nino Southern Oscillation can provide predictability to the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, so that there's, you know, kind of changes in the way the atmosphere circulate because of this big event going on in the Pacific can kind of give us some predictability in the Atlantic in that way. 
Do we um, know how much the sort of amplitude variation in the multi-decadal oscillation in the Atlantic affects like land temperature in Europe? And is it easy to like disentangle that from global warming effects? Yeah, so, so that's no, that's a good question because because there's something to notice is that we've just been on an upward phase of the AMO over the last kind of 30 to 40 years. Uh, and this does imprint um, on the temperatures in Europe, particularly in summer. So this, this figure is taken from a paper of one of my colleagues. Uh, and I think this is showing the difference in this must be in surface air temperature in the summer between the positive and negative phases. Um, and so I suppose, I mean, what this figure shows is that there is clearly a significant impact, but it does also give you a kind of indication of the level of impact that it's having. So this is an average temperature over the summer. So we're averaging out all the kind of meteorological weather fluctuations, <coughs> excuse me. And you can also see the magnitude here is less than a degree. So, um, I mean, so if you take these averages, um, then you, you can detect, you, you, can, you can certainly detect a kind of impact. But I mean, in terms of our day-to-day -day experience of the weather, I mean, you know, whether you have a, one of these kind of big high pressure systems with sunny skies or whether if you have an overcast day, colder weather coming from the north, this is by far going to dominate your experience. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so does that answer your question? I mean, I think things like the, if, if we're trying to unpick the, in particular, the global warming at, um, uh, kind of impact on Europe, then these all these kind of low frequency oscillations are things which we very carefully try and remove so that we end up with just the anthropogenic um, impact. Awesome. Um, anybody else have any questions? Um, I, had, I had a small question about, um, so when you were talking about um, like the errors that you account for when you're doing a forecast, so you have the error in the starting position, then you said that there's an error in the modeling. Like what kind of model errors do you get? Because I know that the, like the Navier-Stokes equations are like, they should accurately describe the system, right? So what kind of model errors are you sort of assuming are there? Yes. Oh, so thank, thank you for asking that question, because this is actually my area of research. <laughs> so I think that, so the, the thing, um, so, so the thing to realize here is that often when we think about kind of fluid dynamic simulations, you might be thinking about kind of solving the Navier-Stokes equations to predict kind of flow over an aircraft wing or something like this. And there you've got no, there's no time constraints you can solve the equations as accurately as you possibly can to get a really good answer. Um, but when you're making a weather forecast, you do need to produce it ahead of when the weather actually happens in order for it to be useful. Uh, and so what we, what we have to do then is that we have to set the discretization, like the kind of degree of pixelation of the equations at somewhat coarser than we might otherwise like. Um, so if we're making, um, so the, the kind of absolute highest resolution forecasts over the UK um, would be produced with a kind of grid spacing of about four or five kilometers. Uh, and then if you're making one of these ensemble, one of these probabilistic forecasts, the, the grid spacing moves up to more like 20 kilometers. Um, so there's a lot of, um, uh, stuff, there's a lot of phenomena going on at smaller scales than that, which we're not explicitly solving for. So including kind of like gusty, gustiness in the near, near the surface, you know, um, clouds are occurring on scales of more like five kilometers. So in your kind of four kilometer pixelation, you're really not getting those particularly well, and you're definitely not at 20 kilometers. And so these things we we represent in our simulator in, in a more simplified way. So we kind of come up with a conceptual model of what, what we believe is going on. Um, but this is, 
this is really a, a, a kind of the, the biggest source then of, of uncertainty in the forecast. They're really bigger, bigger than the sort of um, like initial condition uncertainty. Yeah. So the, I mean, so I suppose the thing that the the initial condition uncertainty is very large, right at the right, you know, right at the beginning. But the, this kind of model uncertainty keeps on getting added into the forecast. So if you're looking at a, a, a forecast, I mean, so while early in the forecast, they may be quite evenly balanced, you know, by the end of the forecast, you know, you, you keep on adding this, these, these perturbations. Um, but I mean, it's certainly important to, to include both. And so there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of work being done to try and accurately capture both in the forecast. So awesome. that then presumably like the, the bigger our supercomputers are, the more uh, the higher the resolution we can have on that. So how much do you expect that uncertainty to go away in the next few years? Yeah, so no, no, so that's that's yeah, that's that's um that's a really good question. And it's certainly the case that as our supercomputers have got bigger, we have pushed to finer and finer resolution. Uh, and we fill our supercomputers with forecasts. So, I mean, actually, the big operational centers are, are starting a new forecast every six hours. So, so every six hours, they set a new forecast going with just the additional observations they've got in the meantime. Um, and as we go to higher and higher resolution, we do see improved accuracy in our forecasts. But you, I mean, you do hit other problems. And it's because as you kind of, so if you imagine moving from a, say, a, a kind of 20, 30 kilometer grid to a four kilometer grid, unlike the 30 kilometer grid, your clouds appeared within the grid box. You had, arguably, you might have had a, a few clouds within a grid box. So you could try and capture their effect in some kind of averaged manner. And so once you get to four kilometers, your cloud is, 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 is not at all resolved, but is you can't c compute any level of statistics for. And so you're at this really awkward resolution where you are kind of partially resolving the clouds. Um, and so you do actually have to come up with some, uh, I mean, I think there's a, you know, a lot of research work going on trying to work out how best to deal with that. And so then, okay, well, let's just push on fine and go past the cloud, this kind of tricky cloud resolution, but then you'll hit the next process that is going to only be partially resolved, maybe something to do with the boundary layer, like the lowest layer of air in contact with the surface. And so somehow, you know, at some point we're going to hit a resolution which is which is capturing all the things that we want. But this could be at a really very small res resolution, like 100 meters or finer. And then at that kind of resolution, I mean, we, we don't we don't have the observations to constrain our model on that kind of spatial scale. So, um, so I think these, these kind of uncertainties are not going to go away anytime soon. Really. So we have another question in the chat um, saying, is there research on potential uses of quantum computers for weather prediction? There is research on, on possible uses of quantum computers. Yes, um, there is actually um, in, the, in the physics department, there's somebody, um, there's actually someone in our group who's working on it. Um, and it's quite some way off. Um, and it's because uh, quantum, this is my understanding, quantum computers are set up um, to solve linear problems very quickly. Um, but solving anything to do with the atmosphere is trying to solve a nonlinear problem. So the first thing you have to do is to try and work out how to kind of algorithmically code up a, a nonlinear differential equation into a quantum computer. And I think this, that's the first step which and the researcher in, in, our, in our group has, has started with. And I think he has come up with an algorithm now that, that, will, that will work, but then testing that on a quantum computer is another thing. And I'm not sure um, if at the, mo how, at the moment how many uh, effectively, like how many bits the biggest quantum computer can can work with in any one time. So, um, so the, the kind of level to, of precision to which you can you can do these computations. But yeah, I mean, this is a, a kind of novel a novel area of research that is going on. Awesome. Um, so, if anybody else has any other questions, then feel free to interrupt me now. 
Um, but if not, that was really a fantastic talk. Um, such an interesting area of physics, which, well, I definitely didn't know for a while that that was even an area of physics. So it's really great to have somebody talk about it so that people know how varied a subject it is. Um, so yeah, that was really great. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you can email them to our Physics Society email address then if, we're, if you're happy for us to pass those on to you then. Yeah, of course. Um, um, also, so we brought up quantum computers, which of course is one thing that everybody seems to think is gonna solve everything. But another tool that everybody mm -hmm. likes applying to all sorts of problems right now is machine learning. So would you argue that because um, like statistical methods don't work on weather prediction that machine learning doesn't really have much application? Yeah. Um, or could it also yeah. be? No, so machine learning for weather and climate is a huge area of research at the moment. So like every other field, there's been a massive, massive uh, explosion of interest. Um, there's a few different ways that machine learning can be useful. Um, so one of them is in helping us to push to higher resolution. So linking in um, with, with your earlier question. Um, and so it can do this because it, you, what you can do with machine learning is you can kind of build emulators of complex things. So you can take some of these, um, I mean, I said they're simplifications of the small scales, but they're actually quite sophisticated, computationally expensive simplifications of the small scales. You can take some of these and you can emulate them using a machine learning algorithm. And then you can use this to make your model a lot cheaper. And so you can then use it to run um, at much finer resolutions. You can run more ensemble members. So, so kind of more individual forecasts. You can run out for longer in the case of a climate model. Um, so that's one area of use. Um, another area of use in a kind of statistical post-processing kind of way. So we, we have to kind of live with the fact that we make a prediction using our simulator and it does have errors in, in the forecast that it makes. And some of these are random, but some of them are kind of systematic in some way. Uh, and so what you can do is then train a machine learning algorithm to automatically correct your, um, your model output to make it into a better forecast. Uh, so that's another, another area you can do. Um, you can also do, use it more in a kind of, um, in, a, in, in the AI, in the true sense of the in the word kind of um, framework. Um, so one of the things that the, I mentioned a little bit that, you know, the forecasters on the television have interpreted the model output uh, before making the forecast. So, I mean, in general, there are people interpreting the models to kind of come up with early warnings and things like that. Um, so I, an area that I know of in the US is um, coming up with early warnings for tornadoes, for example. Certain, certain you, you can never, you're never going to be able to predict a tornado in your model because it has a length scale of order a, you know, a few meters, but it's a really serious thing if it happens. Um, um, but what you can do is you know what certain conditions in the atmosphere are kind of conducive to the formation of tornadoes. So you can develop a machine learning algorithm or really an AI algorithm, which will automatically send out a warning if, if certain um, conditions are met. And you train this based on, you know, past forecast and past observations of these tornadoes. So there's a number of ways that it can be useful, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so if nobody else has any other questions, then um, I think we'll say bye for now. But, um, you know, keep looking at our page and everything. There's always stuff going on. Um, and we'll be really pleased to see if you come to any of our future events. So thank you so much for coming. And thank you so much for Hannah uh, for th such a great talk. It was really, really, really interesting. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you. Um, so